Ink Ribbon. The year was 1998, and the game was Tomb Raider 3, when Lara Croft was dominating the world of gaming and going on her biggest adventure to date. Now, every once in a while when I do one of these videos, I end up opening a Pandora's box of information that I never knew, and I am so excited to show you guys what I found because there was so much stuff cut from the game, changes that were made, and other goodies. So come in, make yourself at home, because here is my list of the top 10 secrets and easter eggs in Tomb Raider 3. Number 10. Croft Manor. The coolest tutorial in all of gaming once again returns with new additions as well as some interesting things. First of all is Lara's treasure room which has some easter eggs within, assuming you can get there fast enough. Here you can find pieces of the Skion from the first game, the Dagger of Jean from the second game, the Iris, and this little statue which is a combination of the statue from Indiana Jones combined with the face of Mike Schmidt who was the producer of the game. You can also find the Jade Cat statue from Tomb Raider Gold in the pool room. Lara also has a giant secret aquarium you can access. On the second floor, go to the study and pull the book to turn off the fireplace. Climb the wall here and move the block so you can clear a path. Once you flip the switch, a timed door opens that you have to race to get through before it closes. Once inside, you'll find a nice aquarium, and inside of it is a racetrack key that grants you access to Lara's new quad bike track outside. It's actually possible to get the quad bike out of the racetrack and drive it around her manor, but it is very, very difficult. I spent about an hour trying, and trying, and trying, and I finally got it. If you're proud of me for putting in the effort, then please just click that like button. Now, I'll tell you how to do it, but I really don't recommend you try, trust me, it's, it's very difficult. Starting from here, hold the throttle and rev up the engine. When you let go, you basically want to launch just above the middle hedge so that your back tires bump against it as you come down. If done right, and at the exact right angle, it will propel you just enough to land on this spot. Just be careful not to fall off, because that can happen too. Once you do this, you can drive around, and if Winston is wearing his battle gear, you can run him over. Ooh. Speaking of Winnie, you probably know that you can lock Winston in the fridge, just like you could in Tomb Raider 2. But, did you know that there's a new way to trap Winston? If you shoot him, he will fall down backwards. If you keep knocking him towards the crawl space where Lara picked up the pistols, he will get stuck permanently under it and be unable to follow Lara. The mysterious texture you can find in some places, most famously on the roof of Lara's mansion, seems weird and strange, but there's a simple explanation for it. The way that the Tomb Raider engine works basically requires this texture to be placed somewhere to ensure that water textures and a few others are animated correctly. The reason it was placed on the roof is for the simple fact that you're not supposed to be able to go up there, which can be easily done with the corner bug. Number 9 India Here is the early unused loading screen for the India levels. This game starting out in India is actually a callback to the first game. She starts the game near Calcutta, which is actually the first place we ever saw her. In Tomb Raider 1, when she takes a call from Natla, she is in a hotel that is also in Calcutta. The monkeys in the game were programmed to show you where all the metapacks were, but most people never notice this because every player immediately shoots them on sight. Also in the first level, none of the monkeys will attack you if you leave them alone. Shiva statues were originally red and blue before their designs were finalized to look more like regular statues. There was some concern that having Shiva statues as enemies might offend Hindus, but ultimately was left in. This was also directly lifted into the Tomb Raider film where Lara has to fight several statues before activating a giant Shiva statue that comes to life, even wielding the same scimitars. The Caves of Kalia level was originally called the Caves of Kali. Caves of Kalia is in reference to Kalia, a serpent-type deity in Hindu tradition that has a story revolving around a river being poisoned. And the maze may seem complicated, but if you want an easy way to get through this level, just follow the grass. 
In the game's data, Tony is referred to as Tony Firehands, referencing his ability to shoot fire. There's also a possible but extremely unlikely softlock with his fight. If you manage to kill him before he turns the water into fire, he will never drop the artifact and you can't finish the level. And I guess it's worth mentioning that looking at the artifacts, it seems like each one has its own element or power tied to it, with the Enfado one having the power of fire. Number 8 Nevada Here's the early unused loading screen for the Nevada levels. If you look closely, you can see that some enemies in Nevada have a monster on their back. This is actually the Lost Soul monster from Doom. In the military area of some levels, you can see boxes and crates marked MJ-12. These crates are a reference to the Majestic 12, a huge UFO conspiracy in 1947. In Area 51, there are also more alien-related nods, such as the alien being autopsied on the table, which is a reference to an infamous video that circulated in the 90s showing what appeared to be an alien autopsy performed by military doctors. Another weird secret you can find in Area 51 is a large water tank with orcas swimming around. There's no explanation given as to why the military would have these whales here, and they are never seen anywhere else in the entire game, so it's a bit of a mystery. I decided to Google and see if any military experiments were ever performed on orcas, and the only thing I found is that some studies suggested that killer whales are able to quickly and easily mimic human speech. At least you can swim with them, I guess. At the end of the Nevada levels, you find a UFO, and it looks pretty small on the outside, not even being able to hold a mid-sized car. However, once inside, you see that the interior is unexplainably huge, having large rooms and multiple floors, and it also seems that the artifact, called Element 115, is the power source for this ship. It's a bit of a joke among fans that Lara is wearing blue camouflage in the desert, which obviously makes her stand out like a sore thumb among the sand, but it's actually useful once she's inside the military base. Since Lara knew the artifact was in Area 51, she is actually dressed for the occasion. Her only real outfit issue is probably that she's showing too much skin, which in the desert can have you ending up very badly burned by the sun if you're not careful. And while it's common belief that this is the first time we see Lara in America, in the N-Gage version of Tomb Raider 1, we learn that the building for Natla Technologies is located in Seattle. You know, the building where Lara did this. Number 7 South Pacific Islands Here's the early loading screen for the South Pacific Islands. There's no real way to tell exactly where these levels take place, but it's most definitely a part of Polynesia. But Polynesia is a subregion of Oceania, spanning from Hawaii all the way to New Zealand, so it's anyone's guess. In the first level, Coastal Village, once you get to the end area, before the quicksand pit, if you wait around a bit, you can hear the soldier above call out to her. Up here! Sheila! And after reading comments and internet mysteries about who Sheila is, I would like to tell people that this is Australian slang, and Sheila is a word just used to refer to a woman in general, same way that bloke refers to a male. And while we're on the topic, a dunny is an outhouse toilet. Not interrupting, am I? Not bleeding, are you? Not about to use this place as a dunny? No, and no. Smythe, the man seen in the cutscene for the backstory, was killed and eaten by a tribesman in the 1830s, which is how Puna obtained the artifact. This is referred to as the Feast of Smythe and became an annual celebration, which is the feast the tribesman is referring to in the later cutscene. In a day, we celebrate the death of him, the Feast of Smythe. One of Darwin's sailors, poor fool. I just don't want any fly carrying visitors in here. Right, I understand. What happened? Woke up in the jungle with one of those little blokes snacking on my leg, didn't I? A tribesman? While the tribesmen do celebrate cannibalism, evidence suggests that it wasn't the tribesmen eating his leg, as the soldier suggests. 
With the fact that it happened in the dark and the island is inhabited by dinosaurs, it's far more likely that he was attacked by a velociraptor. Puna, who controls the artifact in this level set, is based on a god that controlled lizard people. From what I could find, this is in Hawaiian mythology and his full name is Puna Ai Kauai, and was imprisoned in a cave by his lover when all he wanted to do was go surfing. It also seems like Puna's artifact is electricity based, but I'm not 100% sure. And lastly, the lizard looking enemies in these levels are called dragonettes, and they are all female. There's also a suggestion that they may have been inspired by the hunters in the original Resident Evil. Number 6 London While London doesn't have any unused loading screens, it does have an easter egg in it. If you look at the building with the sign, you can see that it says Charlesworth Street. This is a self-nod to Matt Charlesworth, who was the artist behind it. Thames Wharf is infamous for being able to be completed in less than 30 seconds without the use of any glitches. Here's how you do it. Aldwych may be a hated level among fans, but it actually has a great backstory that makes it perfect for a Tomb Raider level. Aldwych was a real underground station that was decommissioned and closed during World War II, and it was also used for several purposes, including protecting artwork from museums during bombings. The strange men you meet throughout the London Underground are a group known as the Damned, all test subjects for Sophia Lee, who runs a cosmetic company and is after immortality and extreme wealth. You end up meeting their leader, Bob, who sends Lara to get some embalming fluid. While they talk about being faceless, we never actually get to see under their masks, which are made of metal, but there is some suggestion in the story that something happened to them that disfigured their faces and also made them unable to die. Did you know that not only is Sophia Lee's head a retextured version of Lara's head, but also that Judith Gibbons, who is the voice of Lara, is also the voice of Sophia? My what? Oh yes, they're all still alive. Very much so, in fact. In the beta, Sophia had a slightly different design and shorter brown hair. She wields an artifact called the Eye of Isis, and it has two main abilities. First is to harness energy from the air and convert it into beam projectiles and the second is the ability of immortality. It also symbolizes the power of the Earth. After all the sailors died, Stephen sold his artifact, the Eye of Isis, in London, which was subsequently stolen from a museum by Sophia Lee. There's not an exact date given, but it's possible Sophia may have gotten a hold of the artifact as far back as the 1830s, implying she is much, much older than she looks. Number five. Antarctica. For the most part, Antarctica was left alone for most of development, but there are a few noteworthy things. One of the things that seems to have been cut are sharks. Originally, there were sharks in the icy waters, and then they were replaced by a lone orca, and then removed altogether. They were probably replaced by the cold meter, since water serves as a new obstacle in these levels, but I'm not sure. The cold meter takes about 10 seconds to begin to hurt Lara, and it's not far off from what happens in real life. There's a procedure called the 1101 rule, which is used to help people survive in extremely cold water. In one minute, you will go into full cold shock. In 10 minutes, it's incapacitation, and in one hour, you go into hypothermia. So in this case, it looks like Lara immediately experiences cold shock and then quickly goes into the effects of it. Throughout these levels, she wears her iconic orange jacket with white camouflage pants, but in the original beta version, it was actually a white jacket with light blue camo pants. Flamethrower guys won't attack you if you leave them alone. Maybe it's because Lara is almost dressed like an RX tech worker? 
Either way, just like the monkeys in India, they won't bother you, but be careful not to get in their path while they burn other things, or Lara will be collateral damage. I'm still not sure if it's intentional or not, but in the RX Tech Mind level, there's an interesting death if you cause the minecart to crash in just the right spot here. And lastly, I thought it was worth noting that Lara begins Antarctica with a death of a helicopter pilot, and finishes it with the death of a helicopter pilot. Number 4 Lost Artifact Exclusive to PC, the Lost Artifact expansion starts with Lara receiving a strange invitation to a Scottish estate, and she learns about the existence of a fifth artifact, the Hand of Rathmore. There are six levels, and it takes place in Scotland, England, and France, going from a Scottish castle to a subterranean laboratory, and then to the Paris catacombs. Probably the most surprising thing about this expansion is that you learn that Sophia didn't die in London as previously thought. She is the main villain of the expansion, and you have a similar boss fight where you climb an adjacent wall while avoiding meteorites and end up killing her properly and taking the fifth artifact from her. And after getting the Hand of Rathmore, you escape via hot air balloon. Even though it's an expansion that came later, there are still a few interesting things that were removed, like posters of Lara in the Sleeping with the Fishes level, and a hidden photo in the demo of producer Mike Schmidt, which was eventually removed in the final game. Unfortunately, the expansions for Tomb Raider games have never been re-released, so trying to play the Lost Artifact is almost impossible now, unless you have the actual discs, but maybe one day they'll return. Somehow. Number 3 Glitches As with any other game, Tomb Raider 3 has its collection of bugs and glitches, with most of them being good and often utilized by speedrunners and casual players alike. Returning from the first two games is the corner bug, but this time it's much, much easier to do thanks to Lara's new ability to crawl. Simply line her up with an outward facing corner, crawl into it, and when she stands she will be on top of that structure. It might take a few tries, but it's really not that hard. Also returning is the swimming version of this bug. By facing a corner while waiting on the surface, and then diving under, Lara becomes embedded into the wall and magically teleports to the top of that surface. And one last thing that happens is what's called wall embedding. If you do the aforementioned corner bug, but Lara isn't able to go to the top, sometimes she will get stuck in the wall. It seems like she's stuck, but she's actually slowly moving and will usually pop out of the wall on her own, allowing her to get to areas not normally accessible. In Antarctica, the freeze mechanic was added where a meter will rapidly deplete anytime she's in the water. Normally this makes the water a huge obstacle, but if you save your game and then reload it, the meter resets, allowing you to bypass this if you have enough save crystals and patience. Quap is the name given to a very interesting glitch that is in the first three games, but also probably the hardest thing to pull off. Basically, if you're able to get Lara in a very, very specific position, she can become stuck in the floor and is able to glide under level geometry, triggers, and many other things. This is really only used by speedrunners, but it's worth a mention regardless. In London, you can ride a UPV, or underwater propulsion vehicle, which is meant to only work in water. But thanks to one of the easiest and most fun glitches, you are able to turn it into a flying machine that can navigate in water or in the air, and as a bonus, disables the oxygen meter, so Lara wouldn't have to worry about drowning. To do it, point Lara at a wall and simultaneously press roll and jump while moving forward. You'll know you've done it when Lara's oxygen meter stops depleting and the UPV doesn't make any noise. Now a really fun glitch that you can do with weapons, uh, I don't think it really has a name, 
but basically what you can do is take one weapon and fire it at the rate of another weapon. So for example, you can fire rockets at the speed that you would fire machine gun bullets, which can cause insane amounts of damage very quickly, and it's actually really easy to do provided you have the ammo and guns. There are certain weapons that Lara cannot equip while crouched, for example, the rocket launcher or the MP5. Equip that weapon and then holster it. You're going to press and hold the crouch, forward, and draw weapons button simultaneously. And Lara's going to start crouching up and down and up and down and up and down. And eventually you'll see that her gun is no longer on her back and it'll suddenly be in her hands. Now what you do is equip a second gun. And whatever the first gun you had equipped will now fire the ammo of the second gun with the firing rate of the first gun that you used. While all of these have been good bugs that make the game a bit more fun, there are some that aren't so good. The worst one is what's called location looping. If you finish one set of levels, for example India, then go to a new area, but then quit out of the game and then replay a previous level, it's possible for the game to get stuck in a loop where it just keeps sending you back to previously completed levels. To avoid this, it's recommended to not return to previous levels until you've completed the game. And lastly is a glitch that can be fun or horrifying, depending on how you see it. In a new game, skip the first stage, do the all weapons code, and then skip the rest of the India levels. Once you get to the globe menu, select any location and start the level and simply die. Once back at the main menu, select Lara's mansion level and she will now be able to use weapons not normally allowed in her manner. This will cause a few weird things to happen, but the weirdest side effect by far is the fact that Lara will now have two heads. Number 2 Japanese version now, I know this is a bit random, but I just wanted to tell you about the Japanese version of Tomb Raider 3 because it's so different and just very unique to the English release, which was actually included in the Japanese version as a second disc, dubbed the International Version. Now, there are some general things that are different to make the game easier for Japanese players, such as dealing twice as much damage to enemies and having much more ammo and health items and levels, but there's actually much more that was added to the game. One example is save crystals can be used infinitely in your inventory, so you can save as many times as you want. The crystals you find in levels have also been modified so that they glow and emit light, making them much easier to find. They also heal you when you touch them, and occasionally glow purple for some reason. The game is also generally much brighter and easier to see. And the most exciting part about the Japanese release is that a lot of the levels themselves have actually been altered. I quickly played through a few levels and noted what I saw. The very first example is the big slope right at the beginning of the game. Most of the spikes have been removed, and you could easily just slide down all the way. Although there are a lot of health, flare, and ammo pickups added along the way. Also in the first level, the area that's shrouded in plants is now wide and open, and the shotgun is also found here. And in the second level I noticed that Lara doesn't sink all the way into the quicksand hallway, and the invisible platforms don't require flares to be seen. I didn't have a chance to play through all the levels and see what else was changed, but if any expert Tomb Raider players want to try it out and let me know what you find, I'd love to hear what you discover. Number 1 Unused Content Because of the rushed development cycle of the third game, a lot of content was cut or went unused, which I'd like to dive into here. First is the story content, which are scripts that describe what would have been more FMB cutscenes that weren't in the game. These are transcripts I found on a website that detail them, and I can't confirm how official these are, so take them with a grain of salt. But among the scripts are a continuation of the meteor sequence in the opening, showing an RX tech worker finding one of Charles Darwin's men's bodies, and it elaborates about how the artifacts ended up across the world. 
There would have also been a scene where Winston drives Lara to an archaeologist event where she is ridiculed by other men in her field who claim that the artifacts and the meteor don't even exist. But she ends up getting a tip about India and asks Winston to book her a trip to New Delhi. It ends with a final unused cutscene where Lara arrives at the airport and is escorted by a boy named Sajit into the jungle via a jeep, and he leaves her at the big slope, which would explain how she starts the game already in the middle of a jungle. There's also bits of unused dialogue in the raw audio files for the cutscenes. In the cutscene where Lara rides in the truck, there's this unused voice clip. This vehicle is reversing. This vehicle is reversing. This vehicle is reversing. This vehicle is reversing. The mercenary in London also had a different scream when he was hit by the bell. Then you might like to mind. The bell. <coughs> Happy retirement. And Sophia was voiced by a man, but most likely as a placeholder. Miss Croft, I take it you're ready to sign on. To what? My books. You see, with your lifestyle, you'll be the perfect campaign for my products. In the opening scene for Antarctica, based on the original audio, it sounds like there were supposed to be two helicopter pilots instead of one. <laughs> that was Harry. You kidding? I just saw my own birth. In Lara's home, there are a few unused clips of dialogue, implying that there may have been a tumbling section similar to the first game at one point. We haven't finished tumbling just yet. I haven't finished the exercise yet. You already know how to get me out of here. Use the directional buttons to move me around the house. There's also some lines for various other things like exploring the house, beating the assault course, and driving the quad bike. I prefer to finish my exercises before taking a dip. Is that the fastest you can go? Who says women can't drive? While we're on the subject of her home, I did get a hold of a few beta builds of the game before it was finished, and noticed this level had a lot of different stuff, though it was very glitchy and unfinished. I noticed that the crawling area of the obstacle course, which is normally stone looking, was instead textured with a wire mesh material. Also, several doors and windows were missing from the house, as well as a proper door leading to the quad bike track. I also got a hold of a very early prototype of the game, made playable thanks to Tomb of Ash, and these are mostly just sort of level vignettes as a proof of concept to kind of present a general vibe of each level, and were given very uh, interesting names. One of the biggest things cut from the game was an entire level set which would have taken place in Peru. I believe that the probable reason these levels were cut is that they were replaced with the South Pacific Islands, which is notable if you compare the environments and see how similar they are, but there's never been an official explanation given, so who knows. There was also a level that was to take place in St. Paul's Cathedral and would have featured a ghost, but it was scrapped and later became All Hollows. In the beta builds, you can see that All Hollows was cut from London, as it was listed as the second London level. It was instead added as the final secret unlockable level, which was a reward for finding every secret in the entire game. Lara also had different sprint and roll animations, seen all the way up to just before the game's release, appearing in several demos along with a few different grunts and noises that she makes. Lara also almost had a knife and a forward roll while crawling. In this behind the scenes clip, you can see Lara being animated with a knife in hand, which she was originally going to have both as a melee weapon and a tool. She also had the ability to do a forward roll while crawling, which would have been amazingly useful, since she not only moves slowly while crawling, but also has to turn around constantly. And that is it for this list. I hope you guys enjoyed this because I sure as hell did. Finding all this information was just constantly mind-blowing for me since I played this game for so many years and had no idea about any of it. In honor of Lara's birthday, every February is Tomb Raider month on my channel, so stick around for more Tomb Raider content coming all month long, and if you like this video, I invite you to subscribe to my channel. It's free, and I promise I've got a lot more videos just like this coming in the future, as well as many that I've already made if you want to go check out my channel. Until next time, I'm Kai Morgan, and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to all of my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Your extra support means the world to me and helps me keep making content for you guys.